This episode is about small desktop injection molders, like these two machines, as well as the LNS 150A and the Buster Beagle 3D. Welcome to another episode. So today I want to talk about benchtop injection molding machines. I have two examples of those. But there are other examples as well that are fairly popular. One is the LNS 150A, and then the other is the Buster Beagle 3D. And there are others as well. The thing to be careful about these is they may not perform the way you expect, so you have to be aware of a few things. So let me talk about the factors that are important for in an, a desktop injection molding machine. First, which is what a lot of people tend to look at as the first thing, is the capacity of the hopper. In other words, how much plastic you can inject at a time. This machine is a third ounce, uh, which is fluid ounces. This machine is, I think, about the same. I'm not really sure. I'd have to look at the, the specs. But the LNS is uh, about twice as much in terms of how much it can inject. So that sounds like a good thing, right? Well, let's take a few look at a few more factors and you'll see how it may or may not be a good thing depending on the types of parts you're trying to create as well as the plastic that you're using. So the other thing is injection pressure. So the injection pressure is going to be how hard you can push the plastic into the mold. If you have a lot of uh, small details, you will likely need more injection pressure. With additional injection pressure, though, comes also the need for more clamping force to be able to keep the mold halves from coming apart. So what happens is, if you look at a mold like this, you know, this is the part of the mold that has plastic in it. All of these sections that have plastic in it are going to be pushing the other mold half away, this way. And so if you look at the cross section of this, and then you take the injection pressure, so, for example, if you have a thousand pounds per square inch, and this happens to be about a square inch, I don't know if it is or not, I'm just saying let's pretend that it is, and then it means that you would need a thousand pounds of force keeping these two mold halves together. And if you didn't have that much force, it would cause the mold halves to separate slightly, which will then cause the plastic to ooze out along the parting line. And that gives you flash. So that means you need to have enough clamping force to deal with the injection pressure. Another thing that's important is the temperature. You need to be able to get up to the temperature of the plastic. Now, pretty much all of the desktop machines will be able to handle polypropylene, uh, TPU, polyethylene, uh, polystyrene, and ABS, which are going to be the most common plastics you use. So it's really back to a question of injection pressure and clamping force. Now I have a third injection molding machine that has a larger area, so it allows uh, larger molds, but it has the same clamping force, which is, I think, about uh, two tons. Um, and here's a mold that I made. And this is a very large area. Now you'll notice that there are some screw holes here. The reason I have those screw holes is because I did not have a lot, enough clamping force to keep the mold halves together for this size piece. I barely had the injection force to be able to fill it, um, but I definitely did not have the clamping force. So what I did is I used screws to bolt the two halves of the mold together. And so that meant putting the screws in before putting it into the machine and then taking the screws out to be able to unclamp the part. That obviously means it takes longer to make each part. So, you know, if you're charging per hour, your expense per part is going to be higher. So that's an example of, you know, what you can do to get around limitations of your machine if you don't have enough clamping force. But if you don't have enough injection pressure, you're just not going to be able to fill the part and it's end of story. And this is where uh, you need to think carefully and need to do a little bit of research if you're going to buy something like the LNS 150 to make sure it can make the parts that you have in mind. If, for example, you have a part thickness of, you know, a wall 
like you're, you're trying to create a, a little cup or something like that. It may not be a very large cup, but, but, it, but if it's thin walled, like you have uh, 40 thousandths of an inch or one millimeter thick walls, you might not be able to fill that with a machine like the LNS 150, no matter what you do. So that means your option is to increase the wall thickness or get a machine that has more injection pressure. Now, when I bought these machines, there weren't a lot of options available. There was a version of this that had a hand pull, um, but I prefer the pneumatic ones. The pneumatic ones uh, are going to give you more consistent control over the pressure each time because you can dial in the pressure and then expect that every time you do an injection, it, you'll get the same injection pressure. And as I'll describe it a little bit later, repeatability is, is really important for getting consistent uh, injection molds, uh, consistent parts. So pneumatic is something I really like, but again, the inexpensive machines don't have pneumatic. The other difference is they typically don't have as much injection pressure. This machine, I'm not really sure how much it has. This one I know. This one is 6,300 PSI, pounds per square inch. This one is a little bit less because the the pusher rod on here, or the injection, I'm not sure what it's called, the, the plunger is a slightly smaller diameter than the plunger on this, but the cylinders are about the same diameter. So that means this will have higher injection pressure than this one will have. Um, both of these machines have quite a bit higher injection pressure than the LNS 150. I actually contacted them and found out that their injection pressure is about 2,000 pounds per square inch. So that means a third the injection pressure of this machine. Uh, and maybe half, not really sure, of the injection pressure of this machine. The Buster Beagle 3D looks like it has a larger diameter plunger yet again. So it may be even less injection pressure than the LNS 150, uh, which is going to limit what you can do. Uh, if you want to use a plastic like ABS, it's probably end of story. For the Buster Beagle 3D, it just won't have the ability to flow because ABS is a less viscous, uh, more viscous, sorry, plastic than like polypropylene. Polypropylene flows a lot better. So th those are things, some things to be aware of when you're looking at machines. Now let's take a closer look at uh, this machine. This was my first injection molding machine. I bought this about 15 years ago from eBay for $500. Now the same type of machine seems to go for about $1,500 today, so the prices have gone up. I think one of the reasons the prices have gone up is because a lot more people are getting into desktop injection molding because the cost of milling machines that allow you to create the molds is coming down. And the software that you need to use, like Fusion 360, is coming down in price as well. The way this works is the air supply comes into the back. I don't have it connected at the moment. There's a regulator on the top, and then there's a pressure gauge here. This um, goes up to 100 PSI. So the pressure then goes through this manifold. There's a, a valve here. You push this in to inject, and you pull it out to release the pressure, and then it will come back up. The mold is held in place with a manual clamp. The mold needs to be two and a half inches tall. That's the distance from the bottom to the nozzle. You can make it shorter if you want, but then you have to put spacers underneath. The distance from the, the back of the clamp to the nozzle is half an inch. So that means I can use half inch thick material for the molds, which uh, works pretty well. So for example, here is a half of a mold that is just half an inch thick. And that works really well in there. All you have to do is uh, put the mold in. This is only half the mold. Put the mold in, center it under the nozzle, clamp it in place, and you're set to go. On the side, we've got the on-off switch and the temperature control, which is not precise at all. It's just a knob that you turn. That means you get somewhat close to the actual temperature you want. 
And then on, on the front, there's an actual temperature gauge. So I, I don't know how accurate this is, but I usually set this on about high, look for about 400 degrees, and then I may have to adjust it up or down depending on the material. And that's pretty much all there is to it. I use a tube with an angle on it and a wooden handle on the other end to fill the hopper with plastic, in this case polypropylene. Pushing the valve causes the cylinder to push the plunger down, injecting the plastic into the cavity. And then I release the valve to release the plunger. When I put the mold back in the machine, I have to visually align it so that it's centered under the sprue and then clamp it in place. So let's now shift to this machine and talk about this machine. This machine is my go-to machine. It's the one that I choose to use uh, if I can. When I say if I can, I'm referring to whether or not I can fit a mold into this machine. If I need to make large parts, then I need to use either my Traven machine, which I'll show you later, or my Morgan. But this is a great machine because it's just like the Emco in terms of uh, the height of the molds. In fact, I can use the exact same molds that I designed for the Emco on this machine. But what makes this machine so much nicer is the repeatability. It has digital uh, temperature control, which I'll show you in a minute. This one has been upgraded, so let me explain a little bit. So this started life as uh, an AB plastic injectors machine called the AB150. But the previous owner upgraded it. So the first thing he did, well, I don't know if that's the order, but he added this clamp. This is a pneumatic hydraulic multiplier clamp which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, this clamp is a two-ton clamp, and it's really nice because it gives you repeatability. It's the same clamp that you find on the AB150 instead of the AB100 that this machine is. The other thing that the previous owner did is added some electromechanical controls. So this is a timer that is currently set up to be in 0 .5, 0 0.1 second increments, controlling a valve here that will control the cycle. And what that means is that I can precisely control the timing of this cycle. So as I say, this is my favorite machine to start with. One of the reasons it's my favorite machine, let me grab a mold over here, is because um, it uses parting line molds like this. Now a parting line mold, uh, and this isn't actually the correct part, but anyway, a parting line mold, you inject the plastic uh, into the parting line itself rather than from the back, like I would on the Morgan. And these molds I just find to be easier to make and uh, easier to work with. So this is a great machine for that. Now, one of the ways that this is different from the Emco is that there's more distance from the back of the clamp to the nozzle. So you can put in molds that have thicker plates, and the thicker plates will make them more rigid. The other thing is that this has an adjustable clamp here. So there's a screw that you use to screw it in, uh, in and out. And I mentioned that this is a pneumatic hydraulic clamp. So the way it works is that inside there is an air piston that moves some amount of distance. I don't know how much. That piston is pushing a much smaller diameter rod that is pushing into hydraulic fluid. That hydraulic fluid is then pushing on the clamp itself. So what happens is you get a large movement here from the air and then a much smaller movement from the hydraulics. That gives you a, if I remember correctly, it's a 40 to 1 force multiplier that you would get from just air. But this does not move very far which is why you need to be able to screw it in and out to adjust it. But it's a great clamp, and I just love this clamp. Now, the other thing about this that is really nice is this uh, stop. So this stop will allow you to adjust the, the mold. So if I want to pull, put in a mold like this, I can screw this in, and I'm not going to screw it in all the way, so that it touches the mold. And that means that I can put the mold back in in a repeatable position each time. And then when I'm done inject, injecting, 
I just push that and the mold comes out to the side. So there are a lot of things about this machine that are about repeatable process. And repeatable process is really important when you want to make a bunch of parts over and over again, which is you know, why I love this machine. Let me give you a closer view of the workings of this. So I mentioned a little bit about this clamp. So the air supply comes in from the back. It's just a regular fitting like you would see on any other air tool. And it goes into this regulator as well as this regulator here. This regulator is for the clamp right here. So you've got it coming in to this valve here and this is a simple valve that opens and closes the clamp. Um, so in this position the clamp is open which means no air pressure is applied to the clamp. In this position you have the full air pressure as set by this regulator applied to the clamp. There's also this inline speed control. So I can adjust that so that this moves slower uh, or quickly depending on how I want to set it. Uh, I generally don't change it that much. I usually leave it where it is. This is the regulator for the piston itself. So it's what drives this up and down. And this goes into this right here, which is the electro uh, pneumatic valve. And so this one right here, this pipe goes to the top of the cylinder and this goes to the bottom of the cylinder. Now you may be wondering why we have a valve going to the bottom and I'll show you that in a minute but it has to do with being able to uh, control the rate of movement going both down and up of this rod here. This is the timer and you can uh, change the, the individual digits one at a time and it's getting a little bit sticky in fact um, that one is not working so I have to go all the way around but this allows me to set the cycle time to within one tenth of a second. Now that's adjustable here but I just keep it on that setting and this has some different cycles but I just use the one shot. There's a switch over here which is connected to this so when I press this switch this is what triggers the beginning of the cycle and then it's automatic after that point. And then up here is the material hopper and there is a lever on the back that opens a door here. Right now the hopper is empty. That allows the pellets to drop into here. Now the pellets pick up quite a bit of speed so sometimes they bounce up and end up like here or all over the table. And that's something I should fix someday by putting a shroud around here but as long as I'm careful it's, it's not too bad. So let me take you around to this side which is the temperature control. And so if I flip this on, this will show the current temperature of, of the barrel in degrees Fahrenheit. And then down here is the desired temperature. So it will turn the heater on and off to control the temperature and then bring it up to this desired temperature and then keep it uh, within a, some number of degrees, I don't know how many, of this temperature. Using this temperature controller gives me really good repeatability of the temperature and it makes it easy for me to write down what temperature that I used for a specific mold and then just enter it back in here and use that temperature the next time I want to make parts in a mold. These are the uh, speed controls that are in the back of the valve. And basically what they do is they restrict the amount of air that is coming out from either of these two ports. One of the port releases air when the piston goes in one direction and the other port releases air when the piston goes in the other direction. So these are, are basically valves that, needle valves I think, that will uh, restrict the amount of air that can flow at a time. And so that means by changing these, uh, like so, you can cause the ram to move a lot slower or a lot faster. And some molds uh, fill better if you move if you fill it slower. Other molds fill better if you fill it faster. Generally, when you fill a mold fast, you're getting a more uh, injection pressure because you're getting a sudden spike in pressure. So that works well for small molds with fine details, but not for larger molds. 
because with larger molds you might blow out the mold and get flash. And by the way, once you start to get flash, um, let me bring up this mold again. So once you start to get flash, uh, in other words, the, the plastic starts to ooze out around the edges. This plastic here is also applying pressure against the other mold half. And what that means is that the more flash you get, the more pressure is pushing the two mold halves together. So once you get flashing, it's really easy to go past and have the, the mold halves really pushed apart and plastic all over the place, which is a mess. I made this episode because I know there are a lot more people becoming interested in desktop injection molding so they can make parts that they have in mind. This episode is focused not so much on whether or not you can make the parts with the machine. It is a little bit, but it's also about what are the characteristics you might want to look for in a desktop injection molding machine. The bottom line here is that not all injection molding machines are made equivalent. Uh, there are pros and cons of all the different injection molding machines and there are limitations that mean you may not be able to make a part that you have in mind with one of the machines that you're thinking about buying. I hope you found this episode useful. Uh, it was probably a little bit dense to be enjoyable. Please subscribe, give me a thumbs up, comment below, and I'll see you next time.